Hi, good evening. I'm Nick Smith, speaking to you from London. Welcome to the second in our series of Alpine Clubcasts, which we at the Alpine Club have decided to run during the coronavirus lockdown. You've just heard Nigel Buckley, our librarian, striking a Mount Everest oxygen cylinder from the 1920s expeditions. It was found in the 30s on Everest, and we strike it like a gong at the Alpine Club in London to get members away from the bar and into their seats before lectures. Thanks to Frank Cannings for your suggestion last week that we hear it online, and I, I hope you've all got your drinks ready. You'll, you'll see everybody's muted tonight, but we're gonna try unmuting everybody at certain points and at the end so you can take part. So on to tonight. I'm really chuffed about our speaker tonight, uh, Jerry Gore. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, in, in 2015, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes and I had to relearn completely how to be a mountaineer, how to look after my blood sugar, injecting insulin on belays and latterly on expeditions. Jerry Gore is a, a hugely inspiring role, role model for uh, not only for climbers, but also for diabetics all over the world. And thanks, Jerry, for agreeing to join us tonight. Really, really nice of you. Jerry's going to talk for about 25 minutes on the Eiger challenge, and then we'll have questions and, and answers. So we, we really hope you enjoy it. A wee bit more uh, about Jerry first. Um, he's been an Alpine Club member since the mid 1980s. That's probably before many of you were even born. Jerry has opened new mountain routes on six of the seven continents. He loves all forms of climbing from big walls to alpine routes to high altitude expeditions. He was a Royal Marines officer in the 1980s, a marketing director at Cotswolds in the 90s, an entrepreneur in the noughties and a charity worker in the 20s. Jerry is joining us from the southern French Alps where he's lived since 2003, running his chalet rental company, alpbase.com. So without further ado, let's get cracking. Over to you, Jerry. Are you there? Uh, yeah, I am actually, Nick. Um, so yeah, ready to come in. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to watch me uh, make a complete uh, corona of myself. Um, the Iger Challenge, Dare to Dream by me. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to go through uh, five key points really for Iger's success. So you want to get up this hill, these are things you need to do, but really uh, you can apply these, the, uh, apply these points for getting up any, any mountain and any project in life really. So uh, we've got go when you are almost ready, it's all about you, focus your intent, choose the most appropriate partner and train your brain. So let's break that down. Um, so go when you're almost ready. Um, now, I got this, uh, th this idea really, uh, climbing with this guy, Silvo Caro. He's a complete legend. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the greatest uh, big wall alpinists of all time, three routes on Cerro Torre, which is a big needle in, uh, in Patagonia. And, um, and really his point, you know, we, we were talking on this, on this trip, we did a 64 hour continuous push uh, on a big wall in, 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 in Greenland. And we were talking about uh, fitness and training before we started. And he's going, you know, Jerry, um, you'll never be strong or fit or skilled enough. Uh, actually, it wasn't just talking about me, but he was probably right. Um, but you know, the point is don't try to attain an impossible level of readiness. Go when you're almost ready and that'll probably be good enough. No one gets it 100%. Um, the next one really is, it's all about you. The only thing stopping you from doing a climb is yourself. You decide your dream and you go after it. It's just about how much you want it and how much you're prepared to sacrifice and dedicate your time and energy to achieve your goal. That's why the most successful climbers tend to be totally selfish bastards. So for all those members of the Gore family, now you know why. Um, we're all world-class at making excuses, but successful climbers make fewer excuses than unsuccessful climbers. Uh, take uh, Al Hinks there, my mate on the left. Uh, it took him two focused decades, 20 years, to achieve his dream of climbing all 14 of the world's 8,000-meter mountains. 
Now, there's a lot of th things that uh, you can say about Mr. Hinks, um, but what is very clear is that you don't get an OBE for nothing. Now, I've had uh, my own issues and setbacks in my life, but nothing has stopped me from climbing and daring to dream. I've got a couple of screws through my right ankle. My left knee is obscenely uh, nasty and swollen after I do a lot of exercise on it, so it needs a nice pack. I have my uh, right hand opened up every six years, so I have Deputran. And a few years ago, I was knocked off my bike and broke my neck. And I've got a couple of uh, screws in my vertebrae uh, with a shock absorber. Uh, but the point is, if you want to do it, you will. Now, the third point is focus your intent. As I'm sure you all know, uh, <laughs> even for those who are non-climbers, this is Reinhold Messner, arguably the greatest high altitude climber of them all. Um, he is just amazing. Uh, first guy to climb Everest with Peter Habler um, uh, without supplementary oxygen. First guy to climb all the 14 8,000 meter peaks, the highest mountains in the world. Just a phenomenal athlete. And they did a full physiological study on this guy to find out why he performed so well at altitude. And the scientists were really disheartened to find that physiologically he was disappointingly average. So what did he possess? Well, what he, what he had was an ability to focus intently on a, co on a goal. He would systematically break down the challenge bit by bit until he'd gone through every aspect of the climb ahead. All the different types of equipment, the bivy kit, including the food, the weather patterns, likely conditions, different route options, the history, the geology of the rock, and of course, the descent options. And through this level of focus, he was as well prepared as he could be before attempting any climb. That's focusing on your intent. That's what you need to do if you want to get up the Eiger. Now, choosing the most appropriate partner. Well, clearly Arnie here is not the most appropriate partner for an attempt on the north face of the Eiger. I mean, he needs more bloody clothing for a start. Um, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So that doesn't mean selecting a partner who is a brilliant technical climber if he pisses you off regularly or is unable to give you emotional support if you need it. The most appropriate partner for a Pacific route is the one who complements you the best for the challenges that the route will offer. There's always rockfall and a lot of exposure on the Eiger, and it constantly asks questions of you, which if you choose the right partner, you'll be able to answer. And finally, train your brain. Now, what's that mean? Well, climbers are notorious at saying climbing is more than 60% psychological. So why do we spend 100% of our time training our bodies? Don't forget to train your brain. Climbing the Eiger's North Face is a vertical version of death chess. You make the wrong move and you'll regret it. So don't forget to prepare mentally. Okay, so what's the Eiger all about? Um, well, key facts, it's the most notorious rock and ice wall in the world. It's one of the six great North Faces of the Western Alps, nicknamed Maud One, which is German for death wall. More than uh, 70 deaths on the wall since it was first attempted in 1935. First ascent was in 1938, and it was the last of the Great North Faces by 40 years to be climbed. That's how hard it was. Um, the fastest team ascent, so that's two climbers uh, climbing it together, is Danny Arnold and Stephen Ross in six hours 10. And amazingly, the fastest solo ascent was Uli Steck in two hours 23. That's phenomenal when you know that the guidebook time is three days and two bivouacs, maybe two on the face or one on the face and one on the descent coming down. But that's the guidebook time. And if you want to get guided up it, the costs start at £5,000. Now, if you're Kenton Cool, it'd probably be double that. But anyway, it's a lot of dosh. So why is it so dangerous? Well, it's fast changing freezing conditions because it's got its own unique microclimate. Uh, this thing can be covered in cloud and it can be uh, really, really windy when other peaks around it are in sunshine. It's a big uh, rotting lump of limestone and that produces regular rock falls. So you've got bits coming off it, constant risk of avalanches, technical difficult, uh, technically difficult rock and ice throughout, and it's an endurance fest. It's longer, um, it's the longest north face in Europe. 
It's 1,800 meters vertical, but more like 2,500 meters in total length. That's 2.5 kg. And when you look at my very large cursor, which I'm very, uh, very proud of, you'll see why, because that's what happens to the root. It moves all over the face. And so, um, you know, that's why it's, uh, it's so long. When you break that down and you compare it to the Eiffel Tower, which I'm sure you all know is 300 meters high, it's more than eight Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other. That's a lot of croissant and a lot of climbing. So I first got to grips with the Eiger in 88. Uh, it was a complete uh, cluster, cluster furlough, actually, um, with Lee Clegg, Callum Henderson, and my partner on the right, uh, Stuart. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to get away with our lives and there was a lot of men behaving badly action before and after, uh, certainly not during, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, alcohol consumed um, and uh, yeah, we were very lucky. So uh, fast forward quite a few years um, and I've been enjoying myself and living my dreams, meeting a lot of amazing people, uh, lightning strikes and big walls and rock, and meeting people like Twid and Louise, who are just the epitome of resilience and chasing their dreams. 70 expeditions internationally between these two. Um, now, that was all great up until January 31st, 2001. That was the day I was diagnosed as a type one diabetic. My doctor, Mike Thomas, uh, said, basically, Jerry, your climbing days are over. Yeah, you can go a bit of rock climbing, a bit of ice, but you know, you're gonna struggle on trips. I was struggling with the thought was, with the thought that would I actually see my daughters, uh, Elizabeth there on the left and Charlotte on the right, would I see them grow up? Would I walk them up the aisle if they got married? And what's it like sticking a big needle in your stomach like eight times a day, which is what I have to do. But of course, the big question was, would I continue climbing? Well, diabetes is not an excuse, and that's what I say. But what we did use it as an excuse was, was to move our family, Jackie and I, to the Southern Alps, where we live to this day in Valois, little village at the foot of the Ekran Massif, uh, and we rent out uh, chalets and apartments for climbers, bikers, skiers, and hikers. That's the day job. Uh, if you don't know this area, yes, it does have 300 days of sunshine and six different rock types and the widest range of outdoor sports anywhere in Europe. Not a sales pitch, just saying, but it's amazing. And that's where we live. Um, at the same time, uh, together with my oldest mate, uh, Charles Toomey, and you can see there's Charlie there, and there's Fiona Oi, who's our general manager. Together with these amazing people, I helped set up um, this charity, Action for Diabetics, and we supply uh, insulin, education, and support to 500 children spread over six different countries in Southeast Asia. Now, each one of those children costs us 300 pounds, $500 uh, a year to, to keep alive. And so I put together a thing called a Jerry's Insulin Challenge to raise money, raise uh, profile and awareness about our charity every year. And um, so we get to January 2015. I haven't got my JIC ready. I don't know what I'm going to do in 2015 to raise awareness and raise money for A4D. Um, but two things happened in January 2015 that helped me decide. The first one was I got uh, given these uh, amazing Petzl Nomics. Now, if you're not into climbing, you'll probably think that's a very weird sexual device. But actually, they're brilliant for climbing very steep, um, uh, sometimes overhanging bits of ice. And I, I, I started using these and I go, do you know what? These are cheating sticks. They are so, so good. And ice is so, so easy to climb. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I could use them to climb a big, uh, a big mountain. Maybe that's gonna be my challenge for this year. And at the same time, um, a good friend of mine, um, Tony Whitehouse, who's a bit of a legend, he's a UK uh, over 60s fell running cha champion, together with his lovely wife, Sarah, um, came to stay with us in the Alps. They come every January, they stay for two or three weeks, and we do lots of stuff together. 
and he was rabbiting on. Tony does speak a lot. Uh, he's pretty world class at it. Um, and he was saying, you know, there's this forum on UKC and they post these forums. And the forum that he was rabbiting on about was the north face of the Eiger and how hard it was and what it takes to climb and how difficult it was and all this stuff. And he said, you know, these forums are just populated by people who've got no bloody clue. They haven't even been near the mountain. Um, and, I, and I read it and I saw what he was met and I, what he was talking about. And I just got this head of steam up about, well, do you know what? I'm going to show them. I'm going to do a speed ascent to the Eiger and I'm going to show them that it is accessible, that even old geriatric fossils like myself can get up it. And that was how... The Eiger Challenge, my Jerry's Insulin Challenge 2015, was born. So now we're into um, the end of, uh, of January, and I've got a lot of work to do. Um, I'm definitely not ready. Uh, I am focused on myself, but I wasn't focused on my intent. I had to do a lot of reading and research about this mountain. I didn't have a partner, and the brain was mush. So I had a lot of work to do. Now, what I'm going to do is to show you what we're talking about when uh, we talk about the Eiger and, uh, and this amazing, iconic mountain. I'm going to show you a little uh, video now of a great uh, world-class alpinist called Uli Stepp. This video will show him soloing the Eiger. It's the same route that I wanted to climb, the 1938 route on the North Face, and it shows kind of what it takes to um to climb it and uh and really what it's all about what an amazing um machine uh uli steck is sadly is no longer with us um but he is a uh just an amazing um, motivate inspirational um, figure in uh, in world mountaineering and hopefully that uh, that uh, video gives you a good idea of uh, of the the enormity of that of that face so um, I was training my brain but I didn't I still didn't have my partner and then Callum Musket who I have climbed a number of routes with before he contacted me he said he was really up for it so Callum is brilliant. He was 21 at this time. He was youth ambassador for the BMC. He's a consummate professional, very together, super fit, uh, but he's the wrong age. Why is he the wrong age? Because at 21, what do you do? You text all the time. I could hardly get a word in. He's just, yeah, yeah, Jerry, whatever. Sorry, just got to send this text. No, but really a lovely guy. Brilliant, brilliant climber and just perfect for me. More, more than I needed. Uh, I had to immer immerse myself into the, um, the complexities of this face and really catch up with all the history um, of the Eiger North Face, and it is an amazing history. There's a reason that these things are called Death Bivouac, Second Ice Field, um, Exit Cracks, The White Spider. They've all got uh, stories behind them, and if you haven't read them, I really encourage you to do that. Um, but all this is part of that preparation. And Uli himself, here he is, really helped me a lot. He'd already helped me climb uh, my Chile Threesome, which was the hardest uh, north walls in the Northern Alps uh, a couple of years before. Um, and here he was helping me with climbing the Eiger, but as a team of two. So take 16 quick draws, climb si simultaneously, so climb as a group, uh, as, a, as, a, as, as, as one unit moving together, break the sector the whole face down into sections lots and lots of advice and I started to put together this plan um, this action sheet of the actual route and um, and how we're going to uh, how we're going to climb it I always had to plan my my diabetes stuff so um, there's my kit first aid kit there's my Essentia glucometer kept that in a special insulated bag insulated bag for the pens the insulin pens um, and spare needles and syringes and then here you've got the same kit but for Callum in case I break uh, or lose anything uh, I good training physical training lots of ice 
and also lots of vertical running. Now, this is where we live in the French Alps. That's our house down here. I think I'm just pushing the washing out. That's Valois, 600 people, 1,170 meters, which is fine, uh, especially when these peaks are 3,000 meters. So you've got a 2,000 meter height gain. That's great for vertical running. So vertical running is not actually running at all. As you walk up very, very quickly, you're trying to do 1,000 meters in under an hour, and you're carrying weight. And in my case, I always carry water bottles. One liter of water equals one kg. So 10 kg or 10 uh, liters is 10 kg. Except here I've only got eight. So I was obviously cheating on this one. And of course, you always bring your dog along for company. So uh, I was almost ready for sure. Uh, I was focused on myself uh, and I was focused on the climb. Uh, I very much wanted to do this. I had 500 people supporting me, a lot of promise of a lot of money to help the charity. And I had a great partner, more than appropriate. Callum was brilliant. Um, and the brain, the brain was pretty strong. So we arrive at the North Face of the Eiger at the end of April. We've got a three day weather window. Callum is super busy. I'm a pretty busy guy and we didn't have much time. We were right at the end of the season. Um, when we got up to the Eiger Gletscher station where you, you bivy before you go for, for the route, uh, I spoke to the, one of the helicopter pilots who just landed. He brought a, a, a team off who were exhausted. And I said to him, oh, what are, the con what are the conditions like? What are the conditions like? He goes, yeah, it's the end. I go, well, you know, so what's that mean? He said, well, you know, basically it's the end of the season. Things are melting out. The top exit cracks are already melting. Stuff's starting to come down. If you're on that face um, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to have problems. It's, uh, it's starting to get dangerous. And so I knew this was really uh, now or never. Except we got up early uh, the next day to have a go. We got up to the, um, uh, the difficult crack, which is about 800 meters into the route and we hit traffic and we just couldn't move. There were three teams ahead of us and ahead of them was a, a team that was really struggling on this one pitch called the difficult crack, which isn't that difficult. It's like Scottish five, maybe a bit of scratching, but um, we just couldn't move. Three hours went by, we've just got very lightweight kit on, no bivy kit and we're freezing. Callum's going, you know, Jerry, we've got to go down. And I'm going, well, come on. Another hour went by. I'm blue and Callum had already started down and all the adrenaline are gone. We're just knackered, destroyed and fed up. I get to the Eiger Gletscher, take a picture. Callum's already got his head down and I'm just feeling just destroyed mentally and physically thinking, you know, I'm 55. I'm too old for this game. I'm way past my sell by date. What am I doing here? And then this little kid, came into my mind. Now this is Nook. He comes from Cebu in the Philippines. He came on to our diabetic camp the year before and he's seven years old and he presented at 472 milligrams per deciliter. That was his blood sugar. What does that mean? Well your blood sugars as a non-diabetic is normally between like 90 and 120. He was 472. That's a life sentence and he knew he was he was sick he knew something was wrong and he was frightened his big white eyes and his mom certainly knew it and yet for four days he studied and learned and applied himself and he just flew at the end of that of that uh, of that camp and we've been we're obviously keeping in touch with all our kids and he's doing really well and i was thinking do you know what if he can do that i can have another go at the eiger and that's what i did we got up very early the next day, and by sunrise, we're already above the uh, Hinterstoyser um, Traverse and uh, heading into the uh, first dive field. We went past the team, we're actually bivvying on the face. We're going really fast, really quickly, and efficiently into the, into the ramp, uh, some of the most technical climbing, completely dry of ice, so it's a lot of scratching around with those ice axes, but moving quickly and keeping awake. Uh, I had to drag uh, Callum a bit up the white spider. He had a bad nosebleed and uh, was uh, lagging a bit, uh, but that probably made up for all the times he was dragging me up it. But uh, we were working really well as a team. And soon we're on the summit ridge and heading towards the top. And there we are. We're on the summit. Callum looked like he just got out of bed. I looked like I needed to go back very fast uh, to bed. Um, 
We were so overjoyed at climbing this route. I was so happy. I knew I raised money. I knew that I was going to support kids. I just felt chuffed and really happy to have climbed a world-class route and a brilliant, brilliant uh, climb and to actually help a lot of kids who really needed insulin. So that's what we did. It's Callum Texter Musket, 20. Jerry Fossil Gore, 55. We did it on the 22nd of April. Um, and the sent time... Yes, seven hours, 46. Okay, it's not world-class, uh, it's not a record, but it was good enough. Uh, I didn't drink enough, less than a litre, my bad. I should have drank lots more. I drank, or I ate six cereal bars, good average blood sugars, 15 units of insulin, but the most important thing was we raised $40,000. Sorry, 40,000 um, pounds. Now, uh, as I said, each child uh, that we help costs us per year about £300. So £40,000 goes a long way. There's the proof. Uh, ascent time, 7 hours 46, 38 seconds. That's the distance, 10.41 uh, 10 kilometres. And there's, we, that's where we started. Our, and that's where I recorded this on my uh, uh, Sunto Sapphire. And there's the summit, 3970. So... Key points, go when you're almost ready. It's all about you, focus your intent, choose the most appropriate partner and train your brain if you wanna get up this hill. So the last word really I've gotta to give to a really good friend of mine. <laughs> I get pretty emotional when I talk about Neve. Neve's just a fantastic girl. Um, she's 10 and three quarter years. She's type 1 diabetic, diagnosed when she was 18 months. She's done a, an insulin uh, challenge every year since she was six to raise money for our charity, together with her lovely um, father, Alistair, mother, Jane, and sister, Iona. She's out doing it every year. She's got a pump. She, um, she's, uh, she's got an insulin pump. But her big thing, as she keeps telling me, is, Jerry, small or big, never give up when chasing your dreams and you know what i i say that to myself and neve's such an inspiration for me so that's neve renton she's a great kid and she's going to do really well if you want to help why not create your own a4d challenge and i'll help you do it and with that i'm finished uh over to you and thanks very much back to nick are you there nick i am um, thanks, Jerry. Fantastic. That was uh, a really inspiring, very uh, inspiring talk, I must say. So, so we've now got about uh, fifty. We've now got about fifteen minutes of questions. So, so firstly, do switch on your video if you haven't already. Uh, it's great to see your faces uh, when you speak. Um, if you have a question, please go with your mouse to the bottom of your screen and click on participants. And at the bottom of that screen you'll see the option to raise hand. So um, I can see there are some questions coming in already. So that's, that's fantastic. So um, here we go. We've got a, a question from Alex Hale. Uh, I think Hi Michael's there. gonna unmute you. Can I, go ahead, Alex. Hi there, um, I'm Alex. I'm, I've just joined the Alpine Club as an aspirant member very recently. And in my day job, I am a junior doctor. So know a little bit about diabetes but by no means an expert um, and you mentioned insulin pumps I just wondered if yourself or any of the other diabetics um, had any experience of using them or if they helped solve any of the challenges of being a diabetic whilst climbing um, I, I personally use uh, pens I don't use a pump um, I have used a pump for a couple of years and I didn't particularly like it because I found that all the tubing gets in the way and it's kind of not my thing. Um, and I find I do okay with, uh, with pens. Um, but uh, Neve, I know she uses a pump and she does very well with it. I think it's a very individual thing. Um, they're not that cheap and I, you have to get, you have to be quite lucky I think to get uh, to get one on the NHS, but they are available. Um, but I think it's more about understanding your condition rather than searching um, uh, an easy way out. Because 
a pump is not a silver bullet. You know, you still got to learn about it. You can still get occlusions. They can still stop working and not work. And you've got to understand your body and your diabetes. And I would say that's the most important thing first before worrying about whether to, to go onto a pump. Thank you. Um, Jerry, I, I, I could probably just add something to that because I've, I've actually got a pump myself. So if you can see it's on my arm there, um, if I point it in the right direction. So that, that, that big thing there at the bottom, that's a pump and it's, it's actually a wireless one. So I'm, I'm very lucky I don't have to mess about with, with bits of uh, tubing, um, which is obviously not great when you're climbing. Uh, that I find really, really works, but it took, took a while to get used to. And the other thing is, 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 is something for, is, is a sensor for, for testing my blood. And I can actually do that using my iPhone. So technology's moved on a bit. Um, yeah, anyway, thanks for the, the question. So uh, next question's from Rebecca Howard. Uh, Rebecca, are you there? Um, yes, uh, it's Tom on Rebecca's account, Tom Howard. Oh, okay, good stuff. Um, uh, Jerry, you, you mentioned, I think, that you were diagnosed in 2001. And I was just wondering how how technology has changed with regards to the, the tools and things that you need to take for your, for your diabetes on routes and how it, how that has been made easier by things like, you know, wireless, what you were saying then just now, Nick, about wireless measurement and that sort of thing. How's, how's, how have things like that changed over the last 20 years? Um, I, you know, honestly, I find I go super simple when I'm on a mountain. Uh, I want to trust things that work. Um, that sensor, that Freestyle Libra that uh, Nick had mentioned, yeah, I think is a really good thing. I use it myself. In fact, I've got one, where is it? There it is. Um, and that's great, except above 3,000 meters, it doesn't work. So if you're going to the Himalaya or doing a lot of stuff in the Alps, that doesn't work. I've had problems, like I said, with a pump. Mm. So I literally go with my tried and trusted Essentia glucometer, which has never let me down. And it's great even when it's really... And so, you know, I, I just go back to basics and I keep things simple. So the answer to your question is, I don't use a lot of modern technology um, on a mountain, uh, but certainly off the mountain, I do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, um, Peter, Peter Gilman. Yes, Jerry, lovely talk and a great ascent. And well done, you raised so much money. As you know, I'm steeped in the history of the Eiger myself. I just wonder, since you climbed it pretty quickly, did you get a chance to savour the fact you were at some of the great mythic sites of mountaineering, like the Flat Iron and the White Spider, or did you just kind of carry on through? What sense did you get of the history of the mountain as you were climbing through it? It's a good question. Uh, I suppose if I'm honest, um, I didn't have too much time to think about the history when I was actually on it. But the really, the time when it came over to me very strongly was when I was doing my research. I was reading the books about the Eiger and I was reacquainting myself with the story about Tony Kurtz and, you know, um, all those people who so valiantly attempted. And that's when I really got a sense. But actually on involved with you know getting on with actually surviving and climbing and moving that I guess it it, it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't that that important for me then I was more focused on just getting up the hill and trying to keep up with Callum <laughs> oh, thanks for that okay um, Nicholas Townsend are you there Nicholas yes I'm here it's, uh... I'm Nicholas Townsend here in West Sussex, associate uh, member and uh, Rocky Mountain class uh, climber from Canada. My question is, I do apologize for joining a bit late. I have a family to run here, but uh, would you do it again, climbing uh, the Eiger? Is it something that you would say that you would uh, do um, to make a second ascent, if, if not, if you haven't done that already? Um yeah, I actually, uh, I had climbed it before, but it was uh, it had a total epic on it. Um, I mean, a real epic. It was four days of, you know, hypothermia and all sorts of stuff, lightning strikes, but, or lightning storms. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, as a climber, I'd love to do it and do it faster. Um, I certainly a lot. I learned sure. so much by doing it. Uh, I'd love to do it and try and get a really, really good time on it. Um, but I'm equally aware that, you know, there's lots of other mountains out there to climb. Um, and 
unless someone really convinced me otherwise I probably wouldn't have a go. But I've certainly got some very, very fond memories of them. So you would recommend it then? Oh, that route, and I think any of the routes on the Eiger um, are just steeped in history. And it is an amazing, beautiful uh, mountain. I mean, it, it just... It just sticks out, and I've obviously seen a lot of mountains and uh, and uh, been involved in a lot of mountains. It, it's just one of those iconic faces, and it's hard to explain unless you know you're into you know this th this game. But it's just something that has its own unique feel, uh, and it's it's kind of scary, but it's also inspiring and exciting at the same time. Oh, well done. Thank I, you. Definitely, I definitely recommend it. Thank you, Nicholas. Brilliant. And uh, I think this might be the last uh, question. Tom Bell. In fact, Tom's going to be speaking next week. So uh, it'd be good to see if Tom's uh, mastered the art of Zoom. Uh, are you there, Tom? I am here. Yes. I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, thanks for that, it. Jerry. That was really interesting. Um, like, I've, I've got limited knowledge of, um, of, uh, of kind of how oxygen sats change at extreme altitude um like from the from kind of talks i've been to you get horrifically low oxygen sats at um, extreme altitude that would be life-threatening at kind of lower levels but people seem to function with it is that the same with um blood sugar kind of bm or is it um or is that something that's just not been tested or not really known about yet well, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, first of all, I probably disagree about oxygen sats. I've got a, a, a sat meter and I, you know, whenever I go to the Himalayas, I always take it and I'm always measuring because it's another sign of whether you're acclimatizing well or not. I mean, you, you do oxygen uh, sats and then you also check your resting heart rate. And those are two very clear, um, you can give you clear indication of whether you're actually acclimatizing or not. And I've, I always find my sats you know, uh, my, my, my normal sat now would be about 95. I might go down to 87, 86, but not much lower, you know. 86 would normally get you into hospital fairly quickly. <laughs> well, you know, we had one, one girl on a trip. She went, she was much lower than that. I mean, she was like in the 70s, you know. Yeah, uh, that gets you kind of ventilators and they're fairly <laughs> scarce now. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I mean, uh, I, 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 I felt fine on those sats anyway, but, um, I, you know, but I think in terms of, of blood sugars, it's really weird. What happens is because of the, um, the hormonal effects and um, the, uh, the, the, the stresses of cold, uh, cold conditions and, um, and the stresses on, on your body, it actually makes your blood sugars go high. So you need more insulin at altitude rather than less. And that I thought when I first went to altitude as a, as a climber, I found that was really confusing because I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be on really small doses here. But actually, um, I summited uh, Chilatsi. I got some, I got nine, nine uh, clients up to the top of Chilatsi. It's like six, four, something like that. A few years ago with a, a guy called um, uh, Mal. And um, we... Uh, you know, we were on the summit feeling great, but I felt yeah, a little bit weird. And I tested and I was 21 millimoles, so I was pretty high. And I banged in uh, a bunch of units uh, and, and brought that down. Um, but generally, uh, I find that when I go high, uh, high altitude, I need more insulin than I would normally. Um, and that's because of the, uh, yeah, the stresses uh, on, on the body and the body dealing with that. Um, so it, it is high enough to actually be worrying, not just a kind of convenient buffer. I mean, 21, again, you know your blood sugar's obviously not me, but that would be kind of worryingly high again for, you know, I would be concerned about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I get concerned a lot of things, um, but uh, it's, such a, it's such kind of a trite thing to say, but, you know, when I say diabetes is not an excuse, I really mean it. I mean... Yeah. Lots of people have problems at altitude and they're not diabetic, but they still have yeah. problems, you know. Um, yeah, 21 is not great, but uh, if you're not dying and you're not falling over and you're not in a coma, well, you just have to think, okay, I'm high and I need to bring it down quickly and you bang in some insulin. Um, 
The worst thing is when you're at high altitude and you go low. And I think, and I've done that as well, and that's not great either. But uh, my old mate, Boyan Petrov, a brilliant type one diabetic high altitude climber, uh, climbed 10 of the 14, all without supplementary oxygen. Um, you know, he always said, you know, Jerry, during the expedition, just go artificially high a bit. So instead of average blood sugars about six and a half or seven, you know, keep it about eight, eight and a half, and then you don't run the risk of going too low. And I think that's really important. Uh, but to date, touch wood, uh, I've been okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. That's really interesting. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just actually, just a couple more questions and then we'll call it a day. So, um, We've got another question from Nick, actually. Nick Simons, are you there? Hello. Great talk, Jerry, thank you. What was the descent like? Uh, very fast, two hours 15. Um, so, so what you do, basically, uh, <laughs> on, on, the, on the rock facts, the mini rock facts um, sheet, it, it talks about saying the, the descent, you know, can be quick or it can be a total nightmare. Uh, and I've had both. I've done fast descents and I've done them. I had a real nightmare descent. Um, that, that time uh, I came down, yeah, two hours 15. And it was Callum who led the way. He was in charge of the descent. He was the one who did all the research on it. And we came into the West Face and then we basically glissaded down. And so we we're on our bums controlling our descent with ice axes. Um, and next thing I know, pretty much, we're back in the Iger Gletscher celebrating, you know. So, uh, no, it was all good. It was all good. Uh, one, of the, one of my best descents ever, actually. Uh, quite, quite pleased with that. Could have done with a sledge, but didn't carry it. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Thanks, Nick. Uh, is John, John Morell there? Hi, um, it's actually Lottie on John Morell's account. Oh, hello, Lottie. Hi, go ahead. Hi, great talk, Joey. Um, we were just wondering if you have any insulin challenges planned for this year, um, considering the whole coronavirus business. Has that affected you in any way? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Lottie. That's my daughter, by the way, just for everybody knows. <laughs> <you know>. um, <laughs> my greatest fan, she's brilliant. Um, so uh, what I want to do uh, is try a new route on a mountain called Broad Peak in Pakistan with a fantastic climber called Rick Allen, who is hopefully talking on the AC in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Rick really is a living legend. Um, he's even more of a fossil than I am, and he's just brilliant at high altitude. And we want to try a new route on, on Broad, Broad Peak. It's unlikely that the Pakistani authorities will open the Karakoram for this summer, but there's still a chance. And like I always say, never give up. So that's what we're planning on. That's what we're training for. Uh, and that's what we hope. And if we don't do that, I'm sure I'll probably find something else. But that's the aim. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Lottie. And I think the last question is Paul Newby. In fact, Paul's going to be speaking next week. So uh, go ahead, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? It's lovely. Yeah. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed, Jerry. Quite inspirational, that talk. Uh, I have a grandson who was diagnosed with diabetes at 13 months. And obviously, I'm going to send the link to the video on to his parents, my son and daughter-in-law. And I hope it will be inspirational for them as well. So thank you very much indeed. And Thanks. it is going to be an extremely difficult talk to follow, but thank goodness, I think I'm only doing a third of the evening. And thank you for your full evening, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, actually, Rebecca Howard, can you, can, can you hear me? Hi, Jerry. It's Tom again. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, don't get a complex, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all right in saying it's your birthday tomorrow, Jerry. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. okay folks well i think that probably brings us to the end um if anyone has a, a question uh, whilst i'm waffling on then then do do raise your hand um so i'm just just before i say thanks properly um just to say i'm really pleased to announce that next week uh alpine club cast number three will be new routing in unexplored Tian shan kyrgyzstan 
So it's Tom Bell who, who you heard uh, asking a question, Timmy Elson and Hugh Thomas, and they're busy rehearsing online. They give a really entertaining talk about their first expedition back in 2013. So that's next Tuesday at the same time. As usual, please do send any feedback into the Alpine Club office and any ideas you might have for isolation activities or future Alpine Club casts. And can I say a quick thank you at this point to Nigel Buckley and Michael Delarue who've worked really hard behind the scenes helping us get these uh, club casts out to you. We're going to experiment with YouTube live streaming woo, next week. Um, if there's a member out there who has video editing experience and who'd like to join our team as a volunteer, um, please do get in touch. Um, so thanks, Jerry. Uh, you can get back to milking the cows. Um, happy birthday to Jackie. And, and thanks all for joining us. Uh, keep active, keep safe. And everyone should be audible now again. So if you want to clap, then now's the moment. Good night from London. Good clap for us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jerry. 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 Thank you, Jerry.